Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I wanted to check in with, uh, with one of the gentlemen in uh, politics and public affairs that I respect more than anyone else, Rick Anderson, who is a principal with Ernst Cliff Strategy uh, Group. He is a uh, former, uh, um, what were you, the chief of staff to Preston Manning at one point in time, was key in, uh, in the Reform Party, uh, has been involved in Canadian politics uh, on a couple different sides uh, over the years, and uh, someone who's very close to what's going on. Uh, and just, uh, I think it was uh, a couple of days ago, Rick, you, uh, you, Rick Anderson, um, posted a tweet that said, I believe Trumpism has been extraordinarily destructive to American culture, social cohesion, economy, and international relations. I'm very worried a Canadian version of that will occur. What are you, what are you worried about, Rick? Oh, exactly that. Uh, you know, I see Trump as uh, um, per personally a highly objectionable um, individual, none of the characteristics of uh, leadership that people should em should aim to emulate or, or see as a role model. Uh, and substantively, um, it's not so much that he's too far right or something like that. He just actually doesn't have any particular positions or any particular philosophy, political philosophy. It's just uh, opportunism and cronyism and, uh, and self-dealing. Um, uh, for for himself and for his uh, his allies and his party, um, it's very destructive to democracy. He's uh, attacking all the major institutions uh, that are part of uh, democracy: Congress, the media, uh, elections. Um, you know, uh, and in doing so, he's building a base of people, uh, expanding a base of people who basically think those things are completely dysfunctional. As opposed to sometimes you win your arguments and sometimes you lose your arguments, which is the way democracy really works. Uh, and um, uh, I had thought, um, I was appalled, really, basically, uh, that he was elected in the States. And I continue to be appalled that uh, close to half of Americans would reelect him if he runs again. Um, uh, but I had thought that Canada was uh, so, somewhat immune to, to that. Um, and I still think, basically, we are, um, but not as much as I had, had thought. I mean, only 20% of Canadians say they would vote for Trump today. But they, that 20% represents uh, half of the conservative base in the country. And it's uh, appalling to me that half the people in a major political party in Canada think that Trump is the answer to the United States or to Canada. And you see, again, this week, uh, a meeting of you know 20 conservative caucus members, federal conservative caucus members, with some of the people associated with Trump, and talk about how they have allies here in Canada. Uh, it's just incomprehensible. I mean, what are they thinking? So some people think that uh, Pierre Polyev, who is uh, leading the polls, uh, supposedly uh, and potentially, therefore, uh, going to win the conservative leadership, is is sort of like Trump in Canada. What do you think of that? Sort of like Trump in Canada. I mean, he's not identical. Um, I think I think Pierre has a a stronger grasp on public policy uh, than Trump does, and 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 uh, at least the outline of a political philosophy. Uh, but what he's doing stylistically is picking up the grievance politics, uh, the angry politics, the negativity, um, you know, uh, what he says about the Bank of Canada being economically illiterate is, you know, crazy. His notion that Bitcoin uh, is an opt-out for inflation is just ridiculous. Um, there it is. It's a complete opt-out of inflation. Instead of, uh, of <laughs> losing 7% of your real power, you can, uh, real purchasing power, you can lose 50% of your real purchasing power. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then ride the wave back up. Uh, you know, it's so basically a roller coaster. And the point of monetary policy is stability. That's kind of the opposite of Bitcoin. Uh, but what Bit Bitcoin offers is a whole lot of people to avoid the scrutiny of government, which, you know, some people see as a, uh, a bug, me, uh, and some people see as a feature, um, obviously, care. I mean, what, what scrutiny does it avoid? Well, people paying taxes, people transferring money for whatever kinds of, you know, illicit means. And purposes and so on, uh, away from the scrutiny of government. Well, you know, they may not like that scrutiny, but those those kinds of regulations exist for a purpose. So how do we stop Trumpism from coming to Canada? Well, that's a trillion dollar question that really in one way or another, people in the UK and France and Hungary and Germany and the United States and Canada, all the Western democracies really, uh, have got some version of this. I mean, people have become kind of bored uh, with democracy. They're sort of taking it for granted. Uh, they are allowing it to be reduced down, you know, dumbed down to its um, 
most basic essentials, you know, it's all about winning. No, it's not. It's actually about one, governing and governing successfully, governing for the benefit of the people in the country. Uh, it's not about your side winning. It's about uh, having good public policy uh, that has good outcomes uh, for our societies. You know, whether you measure that in terms of transit or, uh, or uh, the environment or economic growth or, you know, or education, healthcare, and so on, or basically, I think for most people, it's some version of all of those things. Uh, and that's what governing is about. That's what democracy helps us do. It helps us get together in a room and, you know, make decisions. We choose the people who are going to be in our parliaments or legislatures. Um, and they are supposed to work together to have good outcomes. But instead, in a lot of places, partisanship has evolved, including Canada. Partisanship, partisanship has evolved into a take no prisoners kind of uh, game in which it's okay for, you know, say the CPC, the Conservative Party of Canada, to call the Prime Minister of Canada a traitor. Uh, to call him a communist or a fascist or a dictator and uh, all of these things. I mean, the, the language is excessive. And the unfortunate thing is we seem to have enough people in the country who are insufficiently schooled in what democracy and politics are really all about, that they're prepared to buy that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, the CPC and the, like, part, like the People's Party, Max Bernier's People Party, are, are really kind of hard, hardcore over on that side of things. And there's no, there's no way to collaborate. Uh, on a policy agenda, if that's where your starting point is. So, I mean, basically, we are losing the plot uh, on democracy. It's not about your party winning. It's about governing the country properly. I think it's regrettably all about your party winning or, or, or the leader winning. Uh, that seems to be where they're all at these days. Uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, we're talking with Rick Anderson. Uh, we're going to take a break for two minutes and be right back with you. And I'm going to ask him about some of the other issues that are uh, really preeminent in Canada and the Western world today. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. It's a real pleasure of mine to be interviewing Rick Anderson, uh, Principal at Ernst Cliff Strategy Group, former Chief of Staff to Preston Manning of the Reform Party, very involved in politics for, it seems, uh, you know, a couple of decades now, Rick, uh, and uh, in a couple of different uh, places. Um, we were talking about democracy just before the break and, uh, and how it, uh, you were saying people were taking it for granted. In the last Ontario provincial election, only 43% of the people showed up. And, uh, and you had this strange situation is that, uh, um, you know, a party with 40, 40 point something percent of the popular vote ended up getting a very strong majority. And because of our first past the post political system, ended up winning a huge amount of seats um, and their voting power equaled something like 10 to one, a liberal voter and something like 15 to one, a Green Party voter. And, and, you know, the, the strangest thing is the NDP and the Liberals got about the same popular vote. The NDP got, uh, you know, four or five times the number of seats that the Liberal Party got. Um, and, and it was like uh, Premier Ford was doing everything he could to not increase turnout by just running a, you know, some people described it as sleepwalk, uh, sleepwalking to the, uh, to the election um, and uh, uh, ran a front runners uh, campaign to not get people excited. What does that tell you about our democracy? Well, it, it reinforces that point that people are taking it for granted, um, but it also, um, uh, you know, illustrates another thing that you were referring to, Brian, which is the first past the post electoral system. I mean, I'm a broken record on this. I, I've, for 30 years, I've thought that we need to replace first past the post elections with uh, proportional representation. I mean, voters are not stupid. Um, some of them don't pay enough attention. Some of them get their information from very really questionable sources like partisan sources or, you, you know, advocacy groups and don't look at the other side of those arguments or even those facts. But, um, but mostly people are smart and they, uh, they do understand that in many ridings, uh, in some elections, their vote doesn't matter as much as it should. Uh, because it's a foregone conclusion who's going to win in writing A, writing B, writing C, and so on. Um, and in this case, they were told for, through the polls for many months uh, that it didn't even matter who, how they voted in terms of who was going to win the election, that the, uh, the foreign government was going to get reelected. Uh, so that, that those, that those have the effect of suppressing um, um, votes. Now, I don't think that the Ford, the Ford re-election was a foregone conclusion, although I think he's done a better job than his critics will give him credit for. 
and to some extent, the lower uh, turnout is a function of that. People are kind of okay and not seeing the need for change. So that's one of the reasons that fewer people voted. But the other reason uh, is the one about first past the post. I mean, if you're in a riding where traditionally, you know, the Liberals or the NDP or the Conservatives win by five or 10,000 votes, um, it doesn't really matter whether you go shopping or a movie that day or go vote. I mean, it does in a symbolic sense, but it doesn't in a practical sense. And with um, with proportional representation, your vote always matters because ultimately it rolls up into a province-wide total and helps elect more of the people who, who you think are on the right track, whoever that is. And I think Canada needs to start adopting that. We've tried many times and the forces of resistance, usually amongst the leadership of the incumbent parties who you know feel like the system is working because it's giving them a lot of uh, representation and you know usually electing governments with fewer votes than it should take to elect a government uh there's tremendous resistance in the parties to proportional representation but i think we need to go there i spoke with tony clement a gentleman that you probably know well and uh someone who i respect in politics and we talked about this and he said brian do you really want to have uh instability like israel and italy well israel is actually a very successful country of course um uh, you, you know the fact that uh, elections are close and that parties need to figure out how to form coalition governments is not actually a, a negative. Uh, it's a sign of a vibrant democracy. I mean, uh, once in a while, it's so close that it takes them some months to figure out who's gonna be the government, big deal. Um, you know, I, I would much prefer that to uh, someone walking away. What, what did Ford get? I mean, 40% of 43%, 16% of the uh, provinces of voters yeah. Uh, elected a majority government for the next four years. I, I don't. I don't object to him winning the election, but I object to him getting a hundred percent of the power with sixteen percent of the votes. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy that we're not ad addressing this. Uh, the system that was developed in the colonial era um, uh, served its purposes. I mean, in the very first election in the country, eighteen sixty-seven, they didn't even have, didn't even have written ballots. They were voice votes, uh, and only only white men who owned property could vote. Um, uh, you know, so we, our system has evolved a lot since those early days, but not in terms of how we uh, how we define how we're uh, electing legislatures and thereby governments. And I think we really need to fix that. Let me ask you about uh, where we are in the Conservative Party leadership. Uh, um, do you think it's a, a healthy process? Uh, there seems to be an incredible amount of infighting. It's almost as if some of the things that you that that you dislike about uh, about partisan politics actually is happening within the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party is well way off the rails. Federal Conservative Party. I mean, uh, in in Ontario and Quebec, it's in pretty good shape. The provincial parties are in pretty good shape, um, or the provincial equivalent in Quebec. Uh, in Alberta and Saskatchewan, pretty serious problems, especially in Alberta. Um, you know, the, the Alberta Conservative Party, one of the you know heartlands of uh, Canadian conservatism has had nine leaders in three different parties on the conservative side of the equation in the last 16 years since uh, since Ralph Klein left. Nine leaders in 16 years. Uh, it, you know, it's it's crazy. Uh, it's, uh, it's a sign of distemper of one sort or another. Uh, and the federal conservative party is, like I say, way off the rails here, grievance politics, uh, angry, negative all the time, not very substantive, often frequently, frequently uh, dishonest. You know, they never talk about carbon pricing without mentioning that there's a rebate associated with carbon tax. You know, that's just always left off the equation. It's just a, a tax grab, a tax grab where the government returns the money to taxpayers. I mean, that's not, you know, I, I don't mind if people have a different point of view about carbon pricing, but they should at least be honest about the arguments. Uh, and the Conservative Party, Federal Conservative Party, isn't interested in that. It's only interested in destructive politics, and it's basically becoming a clone of the uh, of the People's Party. And it's going to, I think, destroy the Federal Conservative Party, uh, the the Bergen interim leadership, and and Polyev if he if he wins the leadership. Well, I think that'll be the end of that party. Going to destroy the Conservative Party of Canada, really? In its current form, that's right. I think that's what's going on here. How does that happen? Because uh, Chaudet, if he loses reestablishes the progressive conservative party? I don't, I don't know that Sheree would do that if he loses. Um, I hope he wins. Um, but I, uh, and I don't really, I don't really understand uh, the federal conservative party anymore. It's not the party that I helped, uh, help create uh, when we put together the reform party and the Canadian Alliance and so on. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a nasty negative, um, 
a group of people who uh, basically overrepresent one particular part of the country and one particular point of view, which hasn't got a big constituency in Canada. Um, what, what is that? Uh, what is that view and and part? Well, it's kind of Trump light, uh, you know, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, it's it, you know how how caucus members can uh, signal to Trump's people uh, that they're allies. How uh, how they could have you know position themselves with the, uh, the the blockaders and the occupiers back there in the in the winter time, and still continue to do so. Uh, still continue to talk about them as heroes. Um, you know, the actual truckers of this country were driving trucks during that period of time. 90% of them were vaccinated and they were crossing the border every day, bringing people, uh, exporting Canadian products and importing Canadian things Canadians need every day. They weren't locking down the city of Ottawa. Or so if this wasn't a trucker convoy, who, who was uh, protesting for freedom in Ottawa? Anarchists. People who wanted to bring down the government, people who want to tear down whoever the government of the day is, it's Trudeau, yes, of course. You saw the signs in front of the, uh, in front of the parliament buildings, in front of the PM's office. Uh, you, you know, I mean, a nasty group of people with a nasty style of politics, uh, with a very disruptive and damaging uh, approach to, uh, to demonstrating over three weeks in Ottawa, basically shutting down the capital of the country, shutting down the ambassador bridge between Detroit and Michigan, the biggest trade, trade uh, route in the country in North America. Uh, you know, I mean, this isn't how you do these things. Um, but they didn't care about that. They just cared about getting attention. Um, so Jean Charest in a leadership uh, uh, debate said that uh, because Pierre Polyev supported the trucker convoy, he uh, effectively was unqualified to make laws uh, and should therefore not be running for prime minister. And uh, I think Polyev responded that because uh, um, Chere wasn't truly a conservative because he was a liberal premier of uh, Quebec. He shouldn't uh, be qualified to run for leadership of the Conservative Party. What do you think of those kinds of, uh, of allegations back and forth? Well, I think Chere is right and Polyev is wrong. Uh, I think uh, the supporting the convoy, it wasn't really a convoy, uh, but supporting the uh, occupation of Ottawa and the blockade of the border uh, is delegitimizing. It's, it's disqualifying for somebody who wants to be prime minister of the country. Um, I think the ongoing spat about the uh, Emergencies Act is r ridiculous. It's, uh, it was obvious on the face of it. If you were anywhere near Ottawa, as I was during that time, uh, that, that these people weren't going to get moved uh, in the normal way. Uh, so uh, the, uh, so I, I think, you know, I think Polyev is dead wrong about that. And I think Chere is, is, is correct about it. I was speaking to a, a Conservative Party insider who I, I said uh, I thought Polyev was like uh, Trump. And he said, no, he's actually representing um, a, a reform party, almost like Preston Manning influence on the Conservative Party. You were very connected uh, with Preston Manning and the reform party. Is there any comparison there? Well, uh, the, the comparison would be that there are people who are unhappy with the way things are going. Uh, but, the, but that's where the fork is in the road. What do you do about it? You just complain about it? Uh, you engage in negative, miserable politics that don't have solutions, or do you put constructive ideas on the table? I mean, Manning's slogan was the West wants in, not that we want out, uh, not that the West wants out. It was, uh, here, here's what we should be doing. We should be reforming our political institutions. We should be modernizing them. We should be uh, uh, treating, uh, you, you know, fiscal, we should be lowering taxes for everybody in the country. We should be treating our uh, the fiscal federalism side of things more fairly than we do. Uh, you know, I mean, he had a series of policy proposals that were well thought through and, all, and in many cases adopted by, by the conservative, by the liberal government of the day, including balancing the budget in uh, three years as he'd advocated in the 1993 election. The liberals said in that time that if, he, if, they, uh, if people followed Manning's uh, zero and three, um, balance the budget in three years um, program, that the country would be plunged into depression, said my friend Paul Martin who I used to support when I was a liberal. Uh, and, uh, you know, a couple of years later, they decided to do exactly that. And they balanced the budget in four years instead of three years. So good for them. Uh, I don't think the difference between four years and three years amounts to a depression or not. So Manning was uh, offering real solutions um, uh, and real themes uh, and, and constructive, uh, constructive ideas. Pierre is, you know, calling the Bank of Canada illiterate and offering nothing in its place other than cryptocurrency. Uh, he, he's uh, saying he's gonna ax the tax. The energy transition that's going on in this country is one of the biggest uh, economic opportunities, one of the most interesting and, and uh, 
fruitful transition that's going on in the country right now. And he wants to undo it by, by undermining the, um, the policy framework that's helping to fuel it. It's helping to point the future direction for how we want to redesign our energy systems. Um, uh, that's fine. You know, there are other solutions, other ways to do that besides carbon pricing. Um, but he's not putting those on the table. He's just going to ax the tax. It's all negativity. That's all it is. And at the same time, uh, and you know, when uh, we have an environment of uh, of inflation skyrocketing up to seven, eight uh, percent, and uh, you know, real issues in regards to the World Bank saying that we potentially uh, already are in recession, uh, the chance of us avoiding a recession is zero, and that we may have uh, years of stagflation. We have a Liberal Party that uh, some would say has moved to the left. So, what's your prognosis for for what we should be doing in the future in, in Canadian politics? Well, I, that, that inflation issue that you mentioned is very serious, obviously, um, and the possibility that it could lead to a recession, maybe a serious one. Um, it probably does need to lead to at least a mild recession, and that's probably the the best cure that could happen. And you know that the uh, raising interest rates cools off the demand that's driving inflation right now, and uh, and we get back into a bit more of a stable period in terms of prices. Uh, and come out of it stronger. I mean, that's what recessions can sometimes do for you. But but the way things are going, um, we could end up with a much more si- significant uh, recession on our hands if it takes that much, if it takes that much higher interest rates to uh, to to cool off this overheated economy. Um, uh, and it's you know it's a bit like landing a jumbo jet on an aircraft carrier deck. Uh, but it's only it's only the central bank and interest rates that are really having the impact. Uh, you know your zero and three uh, analogy. Uh, no one seems to be talking about um, you know reigning in gov- government deficits uh, right now. We we got addicted to government deficits during uh, during the pandemic. Uh, you know Ford in in uh, in Ontario is uh, removing. Um, you know, sticker uh, license fees, uh, tolls on uh, on roads, almost everywhere. It it is increasing uh, payments to people and increasing the deficit. And uh, and the and the federal government, as I said, some would say is you know gone left of uh, of the NDP. I had a chief economist for a major think tank in uh, in in Ottawa on my show, former uh, uh, part of the parliamentary budget office, and he said if uh, pharmacare, which is the price of cooperation with the NDP, is implemented, he said we're going to be back into a Canadian peso crisis. Well, I think the the, the largest terrain of political homelessness in Canada is the center, um, you know, the radical center, as we used to call it sometimes. In Canada, um, most of our governments, if you look at the history of Canadian prime ministers who were successful, who endured uh, for any period of time, uh, they were mostly pretty close to center, center left or center right. I mean, that's the Canadian way, pragmatic policy, what works, what what doesn't, find a a balance between economic growth and social responsibility. Uh, You you know, that's that's kind of the Canadian uh, approach to things. And uh, What's happening is our politics is polarizing. I mean, uh, Polyev and Bernier over on the right, and uh, and uh, and the NDP and the Trudeau is basically in an informal coalition on the left uh, is pushing the political debate towards its fringes, and it's leaving the middle out. And a lot of people, I think, I believe, a lot of people feel um, homeless in Canadian politics uh, because you know that crossover group of blue liberals uh, and red Tories. It you know it doesn't have any. Um, it doesn't have a, a, a party speaks for to it uh, very effectively. So that'll change eventually, I think, uh, in the way politics are. But sometimes it's a messy process of, uh, of that changing. But, I, you know, it's, it's it, to, to, to go back to the, the point of the question uh, about the, you know, the farther left and so on, but also the farther right, um, is, uh, is that monetary and fiscal policy work better when they're in harmony with one another. Um, but what we've got right now is central banks, not just in Canada, but around the world, uh, using interest rates to cool off the economy and thereby cool off inflation and return to a, a more stable economic environment. Um, but we've got governments, particularly here, busy saying, hey, we'll throw seven or eight billion dollars at you uh, to help you get through this, which is actually the opposite of what the, gov- what the uh, Bank of Canada is saying. The Bank of Canada is saying, slow down cool off your purchasing, pay down your debt, et cetera, et cetera. Stop bidding up the price of houses to levels that can't be afforded. Stop bidding up stock markets to uh, share prices that are unsustainable. I mean, that's actually taking care of itself. 
Um, uh, and, and we've got governments whose first instinct is to spend money against that, uh, which actually means you're basically, they're basically neutralizing each other in terms of the macroeconomic uh, effect. So, um, so, so, so basically the government of Canada, by talking about here, we'll give you $8 billion to make your way through inflation, is neutralizing the Bank of Canada's efforts to have people buckle, you know, tighten their belt a little bit. Doesn't that mean if, by definition, the government from a fiscal, fo- fiscal policy standpoint isn't cooperating, that the Bank of Canada almost needs to do twice as much or, or certainly more of, uh, of, uh, of the fight against inflation, which means interest rates are going to be higher than they would otherwise be, which means the recession could actually be more protected, particularly for people that have got debt. That's true. That's that's the danger that we're uh, that's the danger that we're in and 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 this is where the, the the idea that you know voters need to pay close attention to this they need to read read some real real sources of information more than one source and not just from the right or the left but you know understand the arguments because this is our economic future that we're talking about and if people get this wrong if they for, if they support governments um, trying to offset uh, higher interest rates with basically borrowing more money and spending it. Uh, they do actually run the risk that this uh, circumstance will, uh, of high inflation and slow growth will last longer and be more severe than it would otherwise be. But in the short think- term, it, it, it works. Uh, you know, politicians buy our votes with uh, free transit passes or one dollar uh, a fair transit passes with uh, uh, no sticker fees on your renewals, uh, no tolls. You know, it, it, it's governments buying our votes with sloganeering, isn't it? It is, it is, and we should recognize that. And and when someone says, "Here, here's something for free from government," you know, here's a tax, gas tax holiday or whatever it is. So how 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 is that being funded? So what, what are we doing with the money that that we would normally raise that way? Oh, we're going to spend it anyway. Well, how are we going to raise it if we're not going to raise it through that tax or that uh, license fee or whatever it is? Uh, well, it turns out we're going to add to the debt. We're going to borrow more money in order to spend more money. Uh, and that's not the right answer to this environment. I mean, we've got an overheated economy. That's what's driving inflation. We have too many people trying to buy things, whether it's airline tickets or cars or whatever. We faster than the supply chains can can actually serve the need. We need to we need to get we need to come out of the, the pandemic in a smoother way, and we need to understand the effect on uh, on uh, global uh, supply systems of the uh, of the war in Ukraine, which may go on for quite a long time. Energy prices are up 48% compared to a year ago. I mean, that's, that, is, that does call for change behavior. It doesn't just call for the government to borrow money and artificially lower those prices. We've got to actually lower the price of that commodity. And we can only do that by increasing its production or by lowering its demand. That's the, those are the basic rules of economics. And to paper over that by giving people uh, you know, borrowed money subsidies uh, it's really the wrong thing to be doing in this circumstance. We're going to come back and talk about uh, energy and this en- energy transition you talked about of our economy in just a minute. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back with Rick Anderson of Earnscliff uh, Strategy Group in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960, sort of doing a canvas of a lot of uh, political issues and economic issues with Rick Anderson of Ernst Griff Strategy Group uh, right now. Uh, Rick, uh, you mentioned in the first segment um, about our energy transition um, and uh, and the role that carbon pricing uh, is playing in that. Uh, but also you just mentioned that energy prices are up dramatically. And one of the reasons why clearly is the war, uh, the, inv- the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine and the war in, in Ukraine that as you mentioned as well, could go on longer than a lot of us are, are currently hoping uh, and anticipating. Um, what do you think needs to happen uh, with energy, oil and gas, the Alberta economy in Canada today? Uh, a transition needs to happen, uh, is the short answer, Brian. Um, uh, and it is happening. Uh, and it's a transition, not necessarily from one type of fuel to another, uh, although that's part of it. Uh, it's a transition to a lower emissions, um, a lower, lower uh, emission energy systems. Uh, cleaner energy systems. So that's hydro, it's nuclear, it's electricity, clean electricity, um, but it's also lower emission oil and gas. Um, it's a, it's also hydrogen. Um, you know, so there are a lot of pieces to this puzzle and uh, nobody needs to be a, a, a net loser on this uh, if we're smart about it. 
um, you know, 200 years ago, there was a thing called the Industrial Revolution. It was fueled by two things. It was fueled by the invention of the steam engine and the discovery that you could burn coal to, uh, to make steam and power all kinds of things, factories, vehicles, trains, you know, et cetera, et cetera, ships. It revolutionized the world. We're going through another version of that now. Uh, and it's driven by our need to be less polluting, less damaging to our environment um, by burning too much uh, fossil fuels uh, and without, without doing enough to uh, contain the emissions that are resulting from that. And so we're, we're, you know, not just Canada. And this goes back to Brian Mulroney, who was the first prime minister of Canada uh, 30 years ago, uh, to go down to Rio and sign the Rio Declaration, uh, acknowledging the problem of climate change and, and pledging, was the first prime minister to pledge that Canada would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So 30 years later, every prime minister in Canada since then, six of them, have, uh, have agreed with both of those statements that uh, climate change is a serious problem and Canada needs to reduce our, our emissions. We're actually now in the last four or five years getting more serious about that. Uh, under the Trudeau government, which a lot of people in uh, the Conservative Party and a lot of people in Alberta really don't like. Uh, but this is the first, uh, the first substantive progress that were, it's not quite true. Harper did, did uh, you know, did some, made some changes here. He gets no credit for. He made the coal, uh, the elimination of coal powered electricity, which Ontario had started under, under uh, Mike Harris and continued and concluded under uh, Dalton McGuinty. Uh, Stephen Harper as prime minister made that a national mandate that all of the remaining other four provinces that are still burning coal to make electricity, coal being one of the dirtiest energy sources in the country, um, uh, that uh, Stephen Harper turned that into a national mandate. And that's as a result of that, this decade, the 2020s, we're gonna see the end of coal powered electricity in Canada. What we've done with those steps so far is not nothing well, by eliminating coal in our uh, uh, in our electricity systems across Canada, and that's that started in Ontario. Uh, the uh, we, we've created, we have now in Canada the seventh the world's seventh largest electricity system. Think about that. We're not the seventh largest population by any stretch of the imagination, but we've built here in this country the world's seventh largest electricity system, and a lot of it is exported as clean electricity to the United States, and that's a big market that we can continue to serve. But of those seven, world, the world's seven cleanest electric, seven uh, electricity systems, seven biggest electricity systems, Canada, Canada's electricity system is by far the cleanest. Most Canadians don't know that. When we talk about electricity, we talk about wind and solar and don't want a project here, a gas plant there, a nuclear thing here, whatever, 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 uh, electricity rates, et cetera, et cetera. But we have actually got a reliable electricity system in this country that's one of the cleanest in the world. Um, and now what we're doing is challenging our oil and gas uh, industries to do the same thing with oil and gas. Uh, and, you know, some people will scoff and say, well, you just can't do that. But that's not what those industries say, they say themselves. The oil sands companies, the six of them who produce 95% of the oil in the oil sands, are pledged to net zero emissions by 2050. And they put a plan on the table that involves carbon capture, clean electrification, and conversion to hydrogen. Uh, that as the steps over the next 30 years to accomplish that. Th this kind of thing is happening across the country in almost every place where we produce energy or use energy that we're looking at ways of doing it with, uh, with less, of, less emissions. And it's, it's, it's transformational. It's creating all kinds of new opportunities for investors and for employers and employees uh, right across the country. In Ontario, that uh, massive reduction in uh, pollution in climate change uh, impact was accomplished by closing the coal, but by uh, replacing it with nuclear. And, uh, and, the, and the nuclear, um, we are refurbishing one major plant, but not refurbishing the other major plant. We're not planning on building any new nuclear. And so therefore, the logical replacement for that nuclear power plant is going to be uh, gas-fired plants. Um, a lot of people don't want to talk about the role nuclear has played in that uh, um, reduction of coal-fired uh, plants across Canada. Uh, because they're worried about nuclear uh, waste. What do you think our attitude toward nuclear power should be? Well, uh, we should recognize that what, what you just said is, uh, is true, uh, that uh, one of the reasons we do have a reliable and clean electricity system in, in Ontario, it's over 95% uh, emissions free, uh, is because of the important role of nuclear power in Ontario and in Canada, uh, and thereby in Canada. 
um, we should understand that and we should try to figure out what the next generation of that looks like. I mean, some people are talking about small modular nuclear reactors uh, as being um, part of tomorrow's solution. Uh, Ontario Power Generation, OPG, uh, has uh, now two pilot projects underway in Ontario uh, that are going to produce uh, power from much smaller reactors before the end of this decade. I think it's 2028. Um, uh, and refurbishing of the old nuclear plants is underway. I hope that we don't start closing them. Uh, they are part of the uh, they are part of the past and they're part of the present. And I think they're part of the future. Um, I think countries that have moved too quickly to phase out nuclear, uh, Germany and Japan at the top of that list, are now uh, finding themselves in a tough spot because you can't just replace that that quantity of power. Uh, very easily. So I hope that uh, nu nuclear does have, play an important role in Canada. I think it's going to continue to. Uh, we've got to find ways, better ways of handling the waste uh, than we do. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it's an important part of the uh, of the equation. So are, though, Brian, uh, two of the, the relatively newer technologies in the, uh, in the electricity world, wind and solar. I mean, uh, wind uh, electricity is now 7% of Canada's electricity across the country. You, we can produce wind electricity in almost every part of uh, Canada, uh, including the far north, uh, you know, where we're burning diesel uh, to power electricity systems in, uh, in cities like Yellow, uh, Yellowknife. Um, so, you know, we've got uh, hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, biofuels, uh, and down the road, probably hydrogen, that are all clean ways of producing electricity for us. And I think we need to uh, be smart about employing them all. Because of the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the war in uh, Ukraine, Germany is supposedly going to have to reopen a whole bunch of the coal fired plants because Russia is cutting them off uh, to gas supplies. And Biden is off uh, supposedly to Saudi Arabia to pitch them on uh, increasing their production of oil. And, and similarly, we're uh, you know, trying to persuade Venezuela to do the same. Should we be doing something different in Canada? Should uh, Trudeau uh, have been talking to Biden about uh, reversing his position on the key, uh, uh, Keystone Pipeline? Should we be building a pipeline all the way to Quebec or the Atlantic Ocean? We should be certainly having those conversations. Uh, we should be helping Europe get off uh, its dependency on Russian gas. Um, either by uh, sh shipping Canadian gas. You can't ship natural gas without turning it into LNG, liquefying it, which is an expensive uh, and cumbersome process. But once you've built an, an LNG plant, um, you can do it for forever. Um, so we should, we should probably be producing more of that for Europe and for Asia uh, and for South America, for that matter. Um, uh, and in the meantime, what we are doing is... Uh, is, produce, is supplying the Americans with more natural gas, which they convert into LNG because they've got more LNG infrastructure in the States than we do. We're building our first big plant now. It's not gonna be uh, open for another few years. Um, uh, so I, I think LNG is part of the, uh, is part of the equation. Um, it can be, uh, you know, natural gas can be abated with uh, carbon capture. Uh, it can be abated with, uh, by being produced and liquefied. Uh, with clean electrification, we should be employing all those tools to make it as clean as possible. We should be helping Europe uh, get off uh, get off uh, Russian gas. Um, you know, people have been talking about that for 20 years. That Russia, that Europe has become let itself become over dependent on on an unreliable supplier. Um, you know, which we also learned uh, about America during the uh, during the pandemic. You know, when the chips were down, the Americans wouldn't provide Canada with a vaccine until they'd satisfied their domestic needs. We we were reliant on Europe uh, for Canadian vaccines, COVID vaccines, uh, for the first six months of our vaccination campaign, uh, put us in a pretty tough spot. Uh, anyway, we should help uh, Europe. Um, they don't need any lessons from Canada in terms of how to uh, decarbonize their uh, their energy sector, though they're they're kind of ahead of us and ahead of America by a long shot. Uh, in that, Ger Germany made a mistake uh, shutting down its nuclear reactors. They should not reopen those uh, coal plants. Um, but you know, I'm not here to particularly give the German government advice. But I think that uh, I think it would be better if uh, Germany. Um, became less allergic to nuclear power and started figuring out how to deploy it properly. Is part of the problem um, dysfunction in the political system in Alberta? And you commented about uh, this earlier and, and some of your tweets have been uh, negative in regards to the Alberta system and, and, and particularly some people asking for Alberta or suggesting Alberta sovereignty on its own. Tell me 
what you think the impact of uh, the Alberta UCP uh, uh, leadership crisis is. Well, I mean, it's got several impacts uh, because the conservative movement is so um, centered in, so much of it is centered in Alberta. I mean, it's still pretty strong in Ontario. Of course, we've got a government here in Ontario that's just been reelected for a second term. Uh, so we should not forget that it's uh, living in a completely different way, a much more pragmatic centrist way uh, in Ontario in a pretty healthy fashion. Uh, and it's also pretty healthy in most of Atlantic Canada and the, the Legault's party, which doesn't go by the conservative name in Quebec, also got reelected. Uh, so what's going on in Alberta? Uh, you know, we, weirdly, I think what happened to Jason Kenney, um, who we've got a lot of respect for him and consider him a friend, is he was a, a bit of a victim of his own success. He, his coalition, if you can, if I can put it this way, was almost too big. His tent was almost too big. When he won that big uh, election, he, he had uh, within his caucus, within his cabinet, within his support base, uh, everybody from the farthest right of Alberta politics, which is actually pretty far right um, by Canadian standards, had to, uh, to you know, people who had recently voted NDP. Um, and they, they basically could not get along with each other. And he, was, he had trouble as he went forward with his program, holding his coalition together. And that's come under stress, both in terms of the energy transition, but also more importantly, in terms of the reaction to the pandemic, where the freedom versus public health argument played out really intensely in Alberta. And, and uh, Kenny became really caught in a vice between two strongly opposing groups in his own coalition. And it cost him his leadership. Um, so there's some different ingredients there uh, that are that are kind of unique to Alberta. It's got, you know, one of the most vibrant political, I think the most vibrant political cultures in Canada are basically Alberta's and Quebec's, um, you know, and uh, I grew up in Quebec, I lived there for 18 years. Um, you know, it's, uh, you don't agree, <laughs> you don't agree with all the different perspectives people have got in Alberta or in Quebec, uh, but they, they, in a, in a sense, the political expression, the range of parties there, and the range of ideas that are constantly being discussed are, are amongst the most fertile in the country. The other, the other jurisdictions in Canada tend to be, you know, as my friend Alan Gregg says, uh, gathered around the center uh, more. And so people are playing between the, the, the 50 yard lines uh, to use a football analysis, but, you know, back and forth across the middle. Um, so, but, but Alberta and Quebec are different, uh, you know, and, uh, and sometimes we think of Quebec as the most left-wing part of the country, but it's got a conservative government today, uh, uh, and, and one that's content with. Um, anyway, uh, Alberta is is very disunited right now, um, and has been, as I said earlier, um, you know, since Klein left. Uh, nine different conservative leaders and three different conservative parties, uh, provincial parties in Alberta. Uh, is a sign of, uh, of ferment, uh, and it's not yet resolved. And I don't know how it's going to resolve. I hope it doesn't resolve in a sovereignty movement. Is the NDP going to come back to power? I think there's a good chance of that. In uh, Quebec, uh, you're mentioning uh, conservative-like uh, party in power, but they've been talking about um, nationalism, sovereignty uh, issues, not maybe directly, but uh, nationalism far more of late. And uh, and a couple of bills in front of uh, the legislature that uh, that have been, um, you know, very some people think prejudicial to the English language. Tell me what what you think about Quebec politics today. Well, um, it's relatively stable, which is a, a positive, I think. Uh, you know, the the other style of politics where you've got two opposing forces, strongly opposing forces that are tugging at the steering wheel and pushing back and forth. Every time there's a change of government, a whole raft of policies get thrown out, uh, you know, or abandoned uh, and replaced by something different. That's that's not healthy for society. It's not healthy for your school system or your healthcare system. It's not healthy for your economy. It's not healthy for companies that are looking to make investments in your uh, in your economy and, hi and hire people if the rules keep keep changing. Um, you know, it's better, in my view, if those things happen incrementally with more respect for what's come before, rather than trying to wipe the, the slate clean every time there's a change of government. You know, governments are only around for four years, uh, or that's a standard term at least. Uh, and if you come in and say you're going to overhaul something like, I don't know, carbon pricing, uh, you probably don't get that done until about halfway through. And then, then it has another year of being implemented. And it's only been in, in place for a year by the time you're facing your next election. This is not, uh, you know, and then someone else 
reverse its course again. That's what's been happening with our energy and environmental policy in the country nationally uh, for too much of the last 15 or 20 years. Uh, we need stability in these things, those big projects, whether they're energy projects or hospitals or schools or whatever, uh, they cost billions of dollars. They take many years to plan. They, they take longer to plan and build than the terms of individual governments. And we need to have more stable policy making. Quebec has got that. If you look at uh, if you look at Montreal these days, first of all, there's been a construction boom in the last tech decade. Uh, they've got built two of the biggest biggest new hospitals in the country uh, in downtown Montreal. They're expanding their transit system. Uh, there's a lot of good things going on at a street level, at a, a practical level, in terms of serving the public. Uh, the economy is in better shape than it has been for uh, for a lot of years, uh, and the sovereignty movement seems to be pretty quiet. There is nationalism, as you put it. Uh, I think the restriction of rights, uh, religious rights and freedoms and so on is unhealthy. Uh, I think people need to find constructive ways of challenging Quebec on that. We can't just uh, help inflame passions about these things, but we need a, a con conversation. In my, ex my experience, Quebecers are amongst the most tolerant people in the country. I mean, in terms of recognizing other people's rights, whether it's gay rights or right to abortion or whatever it is, uh, and they shouldn't be restricting their ability to dress as they wish. We're chatting tonight with Rick Anderson. We're going to take a final break for some messages and come back with some concluding comments. And maybe I'll ask him about what's going on in the United States after uh, two minutes of break. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour. We've really had a great canvas of what's going on in Canada uh, with Rick Anderson, principal of Earnscliffe Strategy Group, uh, a long-term uh, political activist in the Reform Party, the Liberal Party, I think every party uh, um, uh, in uh, in Canada, maybe not the the, the NDP yet, but uh, they're 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 going to come if they win in Alberta. You'll be influencing them as well. Um, Rick, you've been posting recently on two topics in the United States uh, that I'd like to ask you about, both uh, this uh, Supreme Court finding that kicked out Roe v. Wade um, and also about January 6th. Um, tell me why you're, you're a Canadian political activist and uh, commentator. Why are you posting about these things in the United States? Well, because we share a continent of some you know, 400 million people and, uh, and we share a lot of culture uh, with one another and a lot of political ideas flow back and forth across the border. So, um, you know, we're in this space together. We don't vote in the same elections, but we share a lot of the same things. You mentioned the Keystone Pipeline, you know, we, that's a project we want to get done across the border. We need both countries to want it to happen. It can't just happen because one of them does want it and the other doesn't. Um, I think there's a, a lot of unhealthiness in American politics these days. Um, I think we're, I think that Trump and other presidents have been appointing judges who will do something that they particularly want done, not because they're terrific judges or uh, terrific interpreters and appliers of the law. I think the Roe v. Wade decision is, is proof of that. Uh, and I think it's really um, a shame to be reversing, uh, to, to, to be turning the clock back uh, decades on that issue. I mean, it's not whether you're for or against abortion, whether you're for or against someone else having an abortion, it's whether or not a woman has the right to choose that for herself. And it's a pretty basic uh, human right. Um, so it's uh, it's too bad that that's happened. It's for sure gonna enliven the debate here in Canada. Hopefully we will uh, not reopen it, but you know, it can't help but stir things up in this country. So um, on the insurrection thing, I mean, what Trump did on January 6th last year was basically, um, you know, inspire a bunch of people to go down the street, go down Pennsylvania Avenue and tear down, you know, ransack the, the Capitol and, and go looking for Nancy Pelosi and Mike Pence uh, because they weren't going to uh, sanctify his uh, claim that uh, the election had been stolen. It wasn't stolen. He never put forth any proof that it was. Uh, and he tried to uh, undermine the Constitution of America and he sent an angry mob to Capitol Hill to do his dirty work for him. Um, that should be disqualifying. Uh, and the fact that to, to any chance that he's gonna be uh, president again, uh, and the, the idea that uh, that's not yet understood by a significant portion of the Republican party, particularly the members of Congress, uh, is very distressing. It should be distressing to us because when the rule of law breaks down in democracy, uh, you're not left with much. Should the attorney general uh, in, uh, initiate criminal proceedings against the former president? Uh, if there's evidence of a crime that will stand up in court, I mean, it's hard to uh, uh, 
uh, you, you know, the hearing is sort of suggesting that, but uh, you know, I'm not interested in political show trials. You know, prosecutors need to look at the evidence and say, can we make this stand up? Can we corroborate this and so on? Did he actually um, do something that caused people to do this or did people make their own free choices? That's his going to be his defense. That's his defense today. So I didn't really tell him to do that. Well, you know, the, the, the speech he gave just before they marched up the street and did it, uh, a lot of people would interpret and say otherwise. But if you don't want something like that to come down to a jury um, or whatever the process is uh, that would be at work here of, uh, you know, having a five to four decision, which is the Roe v. Ro Ro v. Wade for, for, uh, reversal. Uh, you know, we, we don't, uh, you don't want that to, uh, to, to founder because um, like the two impeachments of Trump founder because of partisanship. Uh, we need, the Americans need to resolve that and get, get back to uh, the rule of law guiding their democracy. Rick Anderson, thanks so very much. Great conversation, great canvas of what's going on in Canada, the United States, and the world. I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. Rick, thanks so much. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Always fun talking to you. Good night, everybody.